Hey there, Parker X listeners. This is Brett Wood, and today we are talking with Evian Patterson, the Associate Director for Ground Transportation at the Washington, D.C. Department of Transportation, or DDOT for short. In today's conversation, we're going to nerd out about using data to set policy and price, community planning for D.C.'s neighborhoods and how that's evolving the area, the rapidly changing curb management spectrum throughout D.C., an example of that change and partnering with TNCs to manage the curb in DuPont Circle, tackling all the new micromobility elements that are landing in the community, performance pricing and asset light concepts and how that's changing the way people access the curb, and just in general, why it's fun to be in parking right now. Hope you enjoy. All right, this is Brett Wood with Parker X, and we're talking to Evian Patterson, Associate Director of Parking and Ground Transportation for DDOT, the Washington, D.C. Department of Transportation. Hey, Evian, how's it going? Hey, Brett, how are you? Doing pretty good. Um, so today we're just going to talk a little bit about what's going on here in D.C. and uh, what, 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 what your world is like in the world of parking and ground transportation and, and more specifically curb management. Um, just to get started, you know, how did you get into this role and, and, and really how did you get into parking in general? Well, the, the clouds opened one day when I was born and said, you're going to be a parking um, a manager. Actually, no, I came into this uh, world, I think like uh, many folks, um, uh, a different direction. I was working in a consulting role with uh, AECOM and uh, travel the world, uh, working with building local governments and local finance systems, uh, fee collections and revenue generation. Uh, training uh, council governments on how to budget for their communities. Uh, that was uh, gruesome work for a while. I was in not so many great places, uh, pretty rough uh, uh, environments like Iraq and Afghanistan, and decided I needed a change. I was really interested in local government still and local government development, and I saw uh, an opportunity here at uh, uh, DDOT to come and work on the uh, meter revenue um, uh, analysis piece. Uh, at that time, the, the department was looking at uh, establishing performance parking and demand pricing, and so they needed an analyst to come in and have a look and do the, uh, the, the analysis. Uh, so I came, uh, and within six months, m my managers left, and I was stuck with um, you know, stepping into a leadership role, uh, especially from having some background from before. And from there, it just blossomed into uh, this uh, growth, um, along with the, the growth of the, the, the parking industry, um, a new profession uh, for me uh, came out of that. Nice, nice. So you started in the analytics side of things here, uh, diving into the to the to the weeds on revenue and performance pricing, which is one of the things I I love in this industry is just the data driven side of things. Um, how have you taken that from kind of the, the the start here in the the analyst level into the management and and what you're doing, you know, d district wide or, or neighborhood to neighborhood? What how does that look today? Yeah, I mean now we're everything seems to be data driven. I think five years, six years ago. Uh, we were just talking about big data and um, using data to uh, let the public know and, and explain to the public the reasons why we have uh, programs and uh, this, the determinations that we've made. Uh, that analysis uh, helped build a greater uh, need in the, in the District Department of Transportation uh, around understanding our curbs, uh, especially when we're going into neighborhoods and talking about your uh, management issues, parking management issues, or uh, the, the availability uh, issues. We found ways of uh, using the data to depict the real situation uh, and help the communities come to an understanding and getting them involved with this sort of planning piece uh, with, uh, with, with parking management. Uh, from there, it blossomed into building a, uh, even a data center here at the uh, District Department of Transportation. Um, and uh, now it, it seems that we have to have the, this data and analytics as part of our, any of our decisions that we've made uh, in parking. And I think we've seen that, of course, across the industry as well. That's right. And, and how are the, I mean, your, 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 your neighborhoods, your business owners, I mean, how, 
have they responded positively to this data-driven approach? I mean, it, it seems like it's more transparent when you can come to them and say, this is the reality of what's happening, you know, merged with the perception of what you think is happening. Um, have, have you found that that's been pretty pretty successful? Absolutely. Actually, one of the best stories uh, that we, we have out of uh, the using data with communities was when we were planning in one of the a very traditional neighborhood in, in the district uh, where they said, we have a parking problem there are commuters that are parking on our streets. They're not moving. Uh, so we came into the community, we said, okay, we'll, we'll do the count. Let's go pick a few streets. Um, and let's look at the, the plate information that, of the vehicles that are there. Uh, let's, let's just do a, you know, an occupancy study and join, join us in this. Uh, from that data, we found that it's not actually the Maryland and Virginians that were uh, parking up their streets. It was actually their neighbors who were leaving their cars <laughs> all day long right. uh, and not moving them. Uh, so the, the, those issues of supply and demand, yeah. we help, they came to understand, oh, this is what we deal with and yeah. why uh, we can't just throw up a sign or why we can't just put enforcement out. I mean, well, who are we enforcing? Your neighbor. Yeah. You know? Who, who also needs that parking needs spot, that parking, likely, right? right? Yeah, so it, it's fascinating to me that the same kind of conundrum when you go into a business district, like they complain about people parking all day on street, and it's the business owners and the employees. Absolutely. <laughs> you, your, your business is right around the corner, and you're, you're parking all day in front of the coffee shop. Yeah, yeah. so, um, but that's great. You, know, you can tell the story and come back and say, well, this is the actual problem and the magnitude of the problem. So um, in your day-to-day -day world here, parking and ground transportation, um, what is what is the predominant theme these days of things that you're dealing with like that's just driving you crazy? Uh, well, you I mean this is parking, so any, everything drives us crazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it just depends on how you deal with it each day. Um, you know, uh, I think the buzzword these days is curbside management, and the uh, reason why we talk about that is because we're trying to fit so many uses into one curb. That's right. Uh, and we, you know, a, a few years ago, we were talking about the scarce resource of parking and why it was important to uh, have turnover in uh, availability and using pricing as a, um, a mechanism f uh, for 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 um, creating that availability. But now we're like, okay, we've got vehicle storage and we have commercial loading and we have, um, you know, passenger uh, pickup and drop off. Um, uh, we've got micro mobility. Yeah. Everything that just keeps coming, and you know, we we're we've joined the cha the transportation world, like getting more integrated with transportation planning and network, um, network design, and um, and and sort of that prioritization corridor prioritizations. Uh, parking is always um, you know one of the the key issues that we have to resolve when we think do things like um, installing bus lanes or priority bus lane. What we have to figure out first what happens with that vehicle storage, then what happens with commercial loading during the day um, that is being taken away from the businesses you were just talking about. So, I, I think where we're, uh, you know, parking managers and parking in um, uh, departments are trying to figure out okay, how do we use data one um, and make key you know key decisions that benefit all um, and to the best uh, best ability. Uh, it's it's. We haven't found the silver bullet for parking. You know, now we have to find the silver bullet for allocating the space. That, you know? That's right. And what's fascinating to me, you, you mentioned, you know, a few years ago, scarcity of parking was the number one thing. And the script is almost flipped, right? Like now people, I hear people saying parking is not the number one priority at the mm -hmm. curb. Like loading, passengers, whatever it may be, uh, becomes the number one priority because it's, it's important for business vitality. It's important for neighborhood growth, whatever it may be. And that changes street to street. Like right outside the right. front of the building here, there's one. And then around the corner, there's another need. So um, it's a delicate balancing act. So mm -hmm. hey, take me through how y'all are, are, are thinking about um, – curb decisions like what is what what drives the curb decision when you're making decisions about allocating those spaces mm -hmm. um, I think and I just wrote down this you know a key thing that we are focused on in the district is you know the access piece um, and why our tagline for Park DC is access matters and uh, why that matters is what makes a productive curb uh, now is how many people you can get there uh, safely um, and the trade-offs that we have to make between a single occupancy vehicle versus a 
you know, a bus loading right. or versus a rideshare loading. Uh, so one of the, some of the things that we've been looking at is is developing um, you know, a planned approach to making these decisions based on the typology of a neighborhood. So in our downtown district, we know the priorities there, um, which, like you said, used to be vehicle storage or cars that park. No, it's changed to, okay, mass transit, to uh, commercial loading during the day, to passenger loading uh, throughout the day and um, mostly during the evening now. Uh, and now, and, and also, how do we promote other modes of, uh, of mobility, the multimodal approach, uh, it, so that they're safely, they're able to safely tra uh, traverse the busy area. Uh, couple that with maybe a, a neighborhood that's near the business district, a mixed use neighborhood that has increased in uh, residential density, uh, more businesses. So we have to make a, a dif different decisions based on um, the sort of typology of a neighborhood. And that would be different than if you're in just a pure single family dwelling uh, neighborhood where just a, a few mom and pop stores. Uh, yes, there needs some uh, commercial loading, but that's where the, you, the priorities may shift a little bit more. Um, but uh, the, the challenge here is that we want to uh, welcome all the the uses right uh, the mobility the scooters the the mopeds the uh, uh, putting in bike lanes we, we we want to welcome and and help manage the uh, you know the commercial loading and delivery of people and goods uh, and at the same time we still want to give you some parking access uh, it's just that that's sort of dwindled just a little bit uh, depending on the area Th that's right that's right and the the interesting thing is I mean you kind of mentioned how neighborhoods change districts change I mean, in in today's world they're changing so rapidly like I, I was probably here six months ago and and your your district here there's more multifamily coming out of the ground mm -hmm. and I, I wouldn't have expected like where are they gonna put these people but right. it changes so rapidly but I'm imagining your job is is not something where you just you figure it out and then you you forget about it for a little bit it, it probably is a day-to-day -day, uh, occurrence of making those changes you you gave a really great uh, presentation a couple of years ago at IPMI about some of that type of decision making that y'all have done, especially in the nighttime uh, passenger loading perspective. And I think it was up near DuPont. Mm -hmm. is, is that right? That's correct. Talk about that a little bit. What? Yeah. I mean, so uh, those decisions that we had to make, uh, DuPont is um, a major tourist destination here in, in the district. And also in the evening, uh, we, sort of conversion to a nightlife economy. Uh, just south of DuPont Circle and Connecticut Avenue, uh, there are, are a number of bars and restaurants that uh, around the 10 p.m. hour um, see a, a, an increased um, patronage uh, of, of, you know, bar goers, you know, I'm just going to out and enjoy, enjoy their nights. The Golden Triangle bid brought an, an issue to us that said at 2 a.m. Uh, we were seeing increased traffic congestion. Uh, we're seeing pedestrians spilling out of the uh, the bars and restaurants um, into the streets, creating conflicts with the vehicles and with transit lines. And um, this is an issue that maybe you, perhaps you guys should look at. And so we came out and did some uh, some observations, and we found that part of the conflict is because pedestrians were in the street looking for their a ride share or their taxi um, uh, they're on their phones uh, literally in the middle of the uh, travel lane looking for um, the vehicle so we we opted to, to try um, the removal of parking uh, at 10 o'clock uh, and from 10 to 2 a.m. Um, peak hours um, Thursday through Sunday to create more space for um, those safe passenger loading um, activities. So for your ride share, Uber, Lyft, or Via, for your taxis um, to access, and also maybe your grandma who might want to, you know, she's being nice, she wants to pick you up. Right. You know, make sure you get home safely. That's right. Uh, and it's, uh, it proved to be, uh, you know, a, a positive, um, you know, uh, solution. It, uh, we've, we've heard from the, the ride share companies that it improved their um, passenger matching, the less dropped calls. Uh, we saw an improvement in the traffic flow. Um, we still have our issues with enforcement and people just uh, disobeying the signs. That's something that I think we all have to deal with. 
but it also set the foundation for us uh, determining other locations in the district and uh, developing a newer program called uh, the pick up and drop off zone program where we've used again data driven decisions uh, to determine uh, uh, optimal places on the curb for uh, safe drop off and pick up of passengers uh, and that includes just the removal of a, a portion of the parking just to facilitate that uh, that that loading that that's fantastic so are you are you working with the tnc's the uber the lyft the vias to to to, to monitor that data and and define those locations yeah i mean we worked with them through a third party uh it's actually a great partnership with uh shared streets uh, they uh collect data from the uber and lyft uh and also via uh, companies and, and aggregate and anonymize the data and, and provide us with hot spot analysis of uh, locations where they've seen increased drop off and pick up uh, over a span of the, uh, a time of day. So those are the ways we've, we've gone through and, and we're able to rank the locations and look at, again, the typology of the neighborhood. Uh, and we're able to say, okay, here's a, an area or a location that we can uh, perhaps remove the parking again uh, to create the the space for drop off and pickup. That that's great. And so, I mean, do do the do the TNC companies? I mean, they, they then much like if you were at the airport, they direct somebody to be picked up in in that general vicinity versus some randomized place on the curb. Yeah, we're I think we're heading towards that direction. Okay. I think that um, my, from my perspective, I think you have to create a network of uh, locations, which that's what we're working on building. And when you build that network, the network meaning how does it make sense on a route in route planning um, for the, the TNCs? And then we can start to promote the, yes, we've built it, now use it. Uh, and the TNCs are willing to work with us on that and actually co constantly ask us, where are your new locations so that we can put that in our apps or we can put that in our route planning. Uh, so if we're going to places like DuPont, we're going to places like 14th Street and U Street, that we can direct customers to that area. Um, so that's something that we're we're developing and planning for. That that's great. And, and if you can at least capture like the drop off or the pickup, like mm -hmm. the pickup's the big thing. Pickup tends to be more friction because there's a lot of waiting on on both sides, depending upon who's who's moving the drop off. I I yeah. found like you, you really can't control. You that. can't control. They're it going at all. right to the to the point of drop off, but. But there's less friction. You mm -hmm. get out, and it's over, and, and you move on to the next thing. Um, and it's good to hear they're, they're playing ball because mm -hmm. a lot of times those TNC companies don't really want to – they just want to do what they're doing. And Yeah, we've had a good relationship with them. I mean, uh, you know, over time, uh, we, we've we built a, a relationship with the companies in that it, I would actually point to the inauguration where we had to really come up with a plan for dealing with – passenger loading when the perimeter, actually the network is shut down. Uh, and so where, were, where are your companies, where are you sending your, your vehicles and, and helping? They came in and helped us uh, determine locations that, that they can send their customers and send their drivers so they can do those, uh, uh, those vehicle matching. And I felt that that was actually where we sort of started to build a better relationship with them and, and they are have been willing partners uh for the district that, that's good uh I, I think there's mutual benefits for, for both parties so it's good to hear um and and being a, a large city like this with a large transportation network you've got a little more leverage than you know poughkeepsie might have but right. but i mean the lessons you learn here is going to help poughkeepsie in the future so yeah. that's good um what about you mentioned micro mobility and that's kind of the one that we you know we a couple years ago we were getting our arms around tncs and we're starting to get there how is the micromobility boom occurring here in D.C. and what, what's going on? Well, you know, it's very interesting because you see a lot of departments and, you know, some other jurisdictions that have um, changed their names to from curb, to curbside management yep. and mobility, yep. you know, because uh, when it, whenever these new the micromobility or new modes come um, on, online, uh, there's always a question of where to put them or where where they uh, where they're stored, uh, and that's one of the issues we have here in, in the district. Yeah, we love scooters. It's a new way of getting around and, and, and the new mobility option. Uh, but the public is concerned about the s scooters being left on the sidewalk or in the um, accessible path uh, and, and the potential hazards and trip hazards. So uh, we, you know, scooter companies are trying to figure out ways of either – uh, encouraging their customers to be uh, better users um, and be m more mindful and not to leave it in the sidewalk, 
But where we're looking here in the district and say, how about this? Why, if we're in the business of allocating space, why, why don't we look at allocating a space for micromobility as well? Uh, and, you know, so that we can, if there's ever any worry or doubt where I can leave my scooter, you can look for one nearest uh, um, to the, the intersection protection uh, zone to possibly store it there. And this is something that we've just, just started to roll out in the past uh, couple of months and trying out um, with putting out more uh, bike racks in street. Uh, we expanded the bike rack um, capacity to also include uh, the micromobility options as well. Uh, and as we see the proliferation of more, uh, for instance, here in the district, we also launched moped share. Yeah. And there's a concern about the mopeds, these be, these being left on sidewalks. So we have to create the space for that, too. Well, micromobilities or these MIMOs is a new word that we're trying to uh, promote now. MIMO um, uh, as a, an area that uh, you can actually store those uh, those those options. Yeah, that, that, that's that's cool. And um you know, most of the MIMOs these days have been kind of sidewalk based, whether right. it's the scooter, an e-bike, uh, even even the mopeds. And I've, I've ridden some of those; they're they're kind of fun. Yeah. Like they're 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 like little dirt bikes. Um, they've they've been small enough that you can kind of capture them on on the sidewalk side of the curb. I have seen um, kind of just just some examples of where s- smaller like personal pods. They're almost like four wheel vehicles mm. that you can. You can rent, and they, you know, they go 15 miles an hour, and they can move you a little further and a little safer than a scooter or a moped might. But that that might be the next horizon of the MIMOs, right? Yeah. Um, and and then that's not on the sidewalk anymore. Now that is really yeah, fighting true. for that valuable curb space that you are struggling to allocate right now. Um, so that's going to be one that we have to deal with. It's yeah. going to be a lot of fun, <laughs> right? Yeah. So our whole world's getting flipped upside well, down. Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's it, every day is a new day and there's an, another challenge. I mean, it's th- that's one of the the fun parts about being in parking right now and being in the last five years is that, man. This just, the, the scene is just completely blown up, and when everyone turns, well, they've been turning to us anyway to figure out how to store vehicles and, and collect revenue. But now, hey, we need your help on like managing the space, and like, and 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 more and more people are welcoming. You guys got the data. You you yeah, you know, you're using that to make your decisions. It's 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 exciting. It's really exciting. It's a great time to be in the industry if you're not afraid of change, right. because uh, it's changing around us pretty rapidly. Um, I want to go back to your to, to parking for a second. We've we've kind of expanded into curbside and and, and uh, mobility, but but from the parking side, like so again, your first your first assignment here was data and performance par- parking. Um, h- how is that going? Are y'all, are y'all pretty pretty uh, adapted to the the performance based parking, the dynamic pricing side of things? Yeah, well, we uh, just uh, you know, went from project phase two now in full operations with our value pricing project in uh, Penn Quarter, Chinatown, uh, which started in 2016, where we use an asset light approach to um, detecting parking occupancy uh, and helping to determine pricing uh, in a very busy part of the city. Uh, Chinatown is very popular, the Capital One Arena there, uh, major uh, tourist destination with lots of shops and also a multimodal environment as well with the, the metro stops and, and a lot of bus lines that go, go through there as well uh, with that increased popularity for parking. Uh, it's been uh, actually a very positive uh, um, operation where we've been able to adjust the pricing about, we've done eight adjustments now, oh, wow. uh, reaching $7 an hour uh, on one, uh, the busiest streets, but also lowering uh, the rates on, on other streets. Um, that that are not in that sort of high demand area. From there, we're using that um, that approach, this asset light approach. You know, uh, using just some camera feed sensors, a combination of sensors and uh, 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 meter revenue uh, transaction data uh, to determine other locations. So we're hoping to expand in the stadium event zone where we're at right now, where the Nationals and um, uh, uh, DC United stadiums uh, rest in, uh, you know, a need for managing the parking here and managing the availability um, 
Uh, we've seen that increase, so we're, we'll be expanding it here. I, I wish we were a, a San Francisco where they can do the entire entire city, but we're trying to get that practice down. Well, yeah. San Francisco got forty million dollars from your neighbors True. down the street, right? Yeah. So like they, there's there's something to be said for getting forty million dollars to kickstart your program, um, and and even then, like they don't still use all of the sensors right now. Right. Like there's um, so the asset light. I mean, I, I think when 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 other cities that are trying to get in, if in Austin, Texas, said I'm going to do performance-based pricing, yeah. they need to look to you. They need to look to Seattle because that's that's probably the more logical capital investment is to do asset light and get some stream of data that you can make approximations on and then make changes. Seven dollars an hour is uh, is pretty incredible. That's yeah. that's good. Um, I, yeah. And also, sorry, uh, you know, the willingness to pay $7 an yeah. hour. We're getting transactions, and people are saying, it's fine with me. Yeah. <laughs> well, because they can find a parking right. spot, right? Yeah. Like, so, so, you know, there's that triumvirate of, you know, easy, easy location of a parking spot, you know, good quality location from your destination or the cost, right? right. They're willing to pay more because they're right next to their destination, and it's, it's there. So yeah. um, that's, that's fantastic. Um, and if you roll it out here, I'm assuming you're going to be able to do event-based pricing and, and things like that. Right. So. Right now, we, we actually do have event, event uh, pricing. Um, it's a progressive rate during the event, but it's at really theoretical. I mean, you're, the first hour is two dollars and thirty cents, but it, the additional hours was an increased okay. um, uh, rate, uh, depending on how long you choose you want to stay. So the the length of the game is usually four hours. Well, you know, twenty. We're trying to match the uh, off street garages, which are now at fifty dollars um, <laughs> for the event. Uh, we can't get up there, but yeah. we've gotten close to it uh, with a rate of uh, upwards of twenty dollars uh, if, if you stay for the the event. Um, but it, again, the intent there is to provide that availability to event goers that uh, you know decide to use their single occupancy vehicle, or their, or maybe they're bringing other folks. Uh, but uh, there is a willingness to pay that as well. We're going to use the data and uh, the get um, the approach that we had in Chinatown uh, to apply it down here to see if we got those same rates. You know. Okay, yeah. well, that's 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 pretty cool. Um, that it sounds like you've, you're basically using every tool in the parking and curbside toolbox. You got to. Well, yeah, you've got a very diverse and dynamic city. So, um, so so you know, we've talked a lot about like this this changing dynamic and the things that are happening right now. And but, but what 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 concerns you or excites you about the future of our industry? Because there's there's some things on the horizon that can really disrupt what we're doing. And you know, what what is it that, that keeps you up at night? Oh. Luckily, I've got I've found ways to get back to sleep at night. No, no. Um, <laughs> um, you know what still keeps me up at night, especially with all these great um, uh, new uh, approaches to managing the curbside. I'm, I'm still concerned about the communication on street and uh, the enforcement. Uh, you know, yeah, we've got to, we have to get that down if we're going to be ready for the other disruption. If you know, one of the major disruption that everyone's been speaking of is the autonomous vehicle. Uh, jury's still out on it, but uh, you know they'll be looking to us to not only be able to manage the space for an autonomous vehicle drop off and pick up or their their use of the roadway, uh, but how we communicate. You know, do we use more signs, or do we use the app uh, based? And then from there, how do we keep the space clear? Yeah. Um, I mean, those are the the issues that we have right now, with, even with the pick up and drop off zone that says no parking yeah it's an international p people disobey because they're taking taking the uh, the risk so the what keeps me up at night is okay we want to put up these new um uh, technologies but we really have to make sure we have a way of uh keeping people true and 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 that they uh, obey the space if you will um and and we can't rely on our tr just traditional way of enforcing because we just don't have the labor resources well, you'd for have it. to hire Yep. 10,000 people, Absolutely. right? Yeah. And, and I don't know, we just don't have, no city has that money. Yeah. So. <laughs> yep. I was uh, talking with Brandy Stanley, who's out in Las Vegas, and, and they did a, a oh, right. pickup drop-off pilot, you know, in downtown for everything you're talking about, Uber, Lyft, via all those folks. And and she said it went great. Like, they, everybody was doing what they were supposed to do with the caveat that they had an enforcement officer standing at the pickup and drop-off right. locations, right? Yep. And the minute they took the enforcement officer away, it went back to haywire again. So... Um, it, it's it's almost like we have to automate mm -hmm. the enforcement side right. of things, which 
on one side is good. You know, we're, we're capturing everything and we're doing everything from a management perspective we, we, we need to. On the other side, we're probably now writing more tickets mm-hmm. and our city councils and our mayors are like, well, we can't write more tickets. Right. You know, then, then it's not a great place to visit. So it's education, it's automation, it's all those types of things that, that makes it interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the autonomous thing, I think what's interesting is you're already doing stuff from the curbside perspective that's going to drive success from an autonomy perspective. So everybody thinks that autonomy is going to be, you know, Google owns a fleet of cars or Ford mm-hmm. or Uber, whoever owns a fleet of cars, and we all you, you, ju- you ju- jump out, I, I jump in, and it never stops moving. The only way for that to work is for us to incentivize alternative modes and alternative use of the curb exactly. today, right? Yep. So, so the things you're doing today are hopefully going to get us there. Yeah, we hope so. Yeah. yeah so, well, this has been awesome. Yeah, um, any, has been. Anything else, you know, you'd like the industry to know from a DC perspective? I just love that this podcast it allows for us parking nerds to just talk about the things that we're so passionate about. And yeah. So keep, keep it, keep it up. It's going great. I, I, I really <laughs> enjoy it. Like I, I can't stop talking about parking. Yeah. So this is fun. So, so thanks for allowing me to get my, my inner demons out today on a no Friday. Problem. So yeah. Awesome. Thanks man. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Okay. All right.